December 1st was the release date for a new book featuring black and white photographs captured by Brendan Fahey Beckett. But what should have been an exciting debut for a young artist was instead a posthumous event celebrating the work of a young man who died earlier this year at the age of 25 following a protracted battle against a highly aggressive form of cancer. Brendan is the son of Assemblymember Patricia Fahey, an Albany Democrat, who joins us in the studio to discuss her son, his artistic endeavors, and the experience of serving in government during this trying endeavor. Welcome to the show, Assemblymember. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for helping to honor my son. So let's start our conversation by talking about uh, this collection of Brendan's work, which had an official release party on December 1st at the Russell Sage College campus in Albany, uh, with all the revenue of sales going uh, to be invested right back into the local arts community because uh, there were some uh, benefactors uh, subsidizing the cost of, of the publishing, namely uh, <laughs> you and your husband. Let's rewind a little. How did Brendan first get into photography, and, and why did he pick up a camera, a film camera, specifically uh, during the final months of his life? Oh, he first began to get into uh, more cinematography, actually filming. Right. Picked up a broken camera of ours in middle school. Uh, then we gave him the real one when we saw uh, that he had kind of an interest and started filming in the backyard, his sister and our next-door neighbor. He was a very shy and very gentle child, which he remained that way. And um, it, I saw that it became a way for him to relate to the world, when he could tell people, do this, or film people while essentially hiding behind the camera. Mm. That just began to blossom. He went to a two-week part-time uh, film program while in middle school at Proctor's Theater. I think Shout out to Mike Furstein, who I think still teaches there. And it just blossomed from there in high school. By the time he was a senior in high school, even for a math class, if they assigned math homework, he was making a film out of it. Uh, so the only one I know that turned a calculus assignment into a music video uh, okay. based on a Radiohead song. So his brain just really went on fire with film. And again, it was a way to relate to the world. Uh, in senior year, he wanted the 32nd commercial that the TU was advertising and, that's and the did Times it union. A, sorry that the times union yes they announced a 30 second commercial solicitation and he filmed his track team and won the uh, won the commercial uh, so uh, went to high school though he really was a math science kid and from high school went on to rpi really thinking physics engineering uh, just didn't like it missed his creative side and ultimately went on to um uh, to Ithaca College studying cinematography. He always did a little photography on the side, uh, including at Ithaca College, because they're so related. Uh, but the minute COVID hit, he was knocked out of work in March 2020. Cancer hit in June of 2020. And he battled full time for the next 20 months. Thankfully, went into remission for two months in February and March of 2021 after countless, countless interventions and major surgery to get it out of his chest and lungs. Cancer came roaring back in April 2021. That summer, we struggled to get the cancer under control. I was on him to just, since he couldn't work, to, to find an outlet, a creative outlet, and thankfully, an integrative medicine doctor at Memorial Sloan Kettering was really talking to him about the work of uh, Victor Havel, a Holocaust survivor, who wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning in Life, and talk to him about uh, what is the meaning of the suffering, what is the meaning of life, and um, began to pick up the camera again. He was very, very sick at that point, but it became an outlet, even when we were walking between the two hospital buildings. He had a different way of looking at the world, and just would take it off of funny signs or a bike uh, juxtaposed next to flowers. Um, or he lived right near Central Park, just even a 20-minute walk. Sometimes that was all he could handle, or not even, in Central Park. And he captured uh, so many unusual scenes with Central Park. So he found the, in my view, he found the extraordinary and the ordinary. So this book that has been released of his photographs has just been culled down to 36 shots out of thousands of photos, even though, like you said, it was a side project uh, compared to his love of capturing moving images. So what was the process of narrowing the, the pool of photographs? Like, who was responsible for that? And what were they looking for in coming up with 
36 photos. Yes, it's amazing that you can get what were probably a couple thousand photos. Um, and prime, most of the photos in this book, uh, again, it's the photographs of Brendan Fahey Beckett, uh, most of the photographs are really from 2021, mm -hmm. uh, that fall and, and winter, and even some earlier this year, right before he died, there's one in there. And so he began to look at them. I tried to get some up on Etsy just to help encourage his photography. I made some note cards, again, just to encourage it all last year. Made but no cards out of his photos? Made no cards out of some of his, his photos, and it was a way to give them back to the, all the... He had, he had countless doctors and nurses and so many people trying to save his life. So the cards were a way to say thank you. At his funeral, uh, three old friends uh, who I know from Bethlehem, uh, Mark Kelly, Agnes Zellin, and Paul Tick. I knew that uh, Mark had published a photographic, uh, a photo book that they had done, Agnes and, and Paul, uh, photos of theirs from the 1970s. It was a black and white. And I said, hey, at some point, you know, would you look at Brendan's work and, and help me see if there's something to salvage? Because he was an emerging artist. He wasn't a professional photographer. Months later, they reached back out. I had forgotten. I'd even said it to them, quite frankly. Totally forgot. <laughs> um, but they followed through all this past summer and went through those couple of thousand photos. And uh, uh, Mark Kelly had been a curator, or is a curator, photography curator. The three of them worked this summer to bring it down to, as you said, it's under 40 photos, and uh, published this photo. And uh, Mark Kelly was insistent that this be an art book not a cancer journey. Uh, well, at some point, I would love to do more about that cancer journey. You don't see any photos in this book about uh, Brendan and uh, during the treatment or photos of Brendan when he was in treatment. He was self-conscious of being bald for just about all the last 20 months of his life. But uh, at some point, we'll do more about the cancer journey. Uh, but this is really an art book. And again, you're right. My husband and I have underwritten all the printing costs of this. We want to pay it forward. There's so many people to thank, so many people who have been so supportive. But the arts help soothe my soul. I learned the hard way that the arts can soothe our soul. And because they became one of Brendan's only outlets while fighting cancer, I really learned to appreciate uh, the, how the creative arts became his outlet and his way of relating to the world. So uh, every book we're selling is going right back out to pay it forward. For listeners just joining us, we're speaking with Assemblymember Pat Fahey about her son, Brendan Fahey Beckett, who died earlier this year at the age of 25 and has had some of his photographs used for a new book that preserves his memory and raises money for arts initiatives in the capital region. Because these photos were chosen with a very critical eye towards the art and not necessarily uh, nostalgia related to Brendan or yes. the people in the photographs, do you feel a connection with any of these photos, either because you might have been there with Brendan when they were taken or because you remember what's shot or just how they, they were chosen and maybe where he was at that point in his life? Uh, I feel a connection to virtually every single photo in there because uh, myself or my husband were with him at, at virtually every one, if not his sister or his girlfriend. We can pinpoint almost to the day of virtually every photo in there. And one was, uh, I, I think it's this weekend a year ago, right here at the Tivoli Preserve. He was so sick, it was hard to get him moving. It was exactly a year ago. We didn't know that, you know, we were nearing the end. We had stayed hopeful uh, right up till the end. But I, I was constantly on him to just try to fight the nausea and keep moving. And we went on a short walk. And uh, two of the photos from that short walk are right here of Tivoli. And when we were at the Historic Albany Foundation um, event last month, we had a couple of the blown up photos there. Every one of these photos, with one exception, is in New York, is in New York State somewhere. So it's also a photo of the beauty of New York State. W was this something that your son had ever talked about or considered having his work published in, in this fashion? Because obviously his work uh, in the cinematic mode lives on on his website. But did he ever talk about wanting something physical like this? This wonderful integrative medicine doctor, Dr. Ragutha um, at Sloan Kettering, uh, when things were very bad in the summer of uh, 2021, when the cancer had returned, 
um, it was just a very scary time that summer. Uh, so she began to talk to him again, I think, with this Victor Havel about what's the meaning of life and, and what 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 is helping you as well as what um, how do you how do you help pay it forward, if you will, and and find some meaning. And so I think that kind of just he knew and I was really pushing him as well to say, Brendan, let's put these up on Instagram. Let's uh, so he, he had revived his Instagram account, which I was so grateful for just something that would get his mind off of chemo. We would sit there for many, many hours a day, blood transfusions, blood transfusions alone can take three to four hours. It was just a full-time job. So this, this would be an outlet when he would then take a couple of photos and edit them, put them up on Instagram. Then when we made the note cards and then ultimately we put some up on Etsy, um, uh, that fell away then as he got seriously ill. At some point, he was beginning to organize a few of the files, whether it was about bicycles or the Adirondacks or Tivoli Preserve. He had them in some uh, like order toward the very end. And um, I did tell him, we're, we're going to try to make the most of those photos and blow up some. I made some with canvas prints for Christmas gifts that he gave to a few friends. So I couldn't have envisioned that we would have such a small but profound uh, art book that, as Mark said, um, it's important to his art will be out in the world. And the important part for me is that his art may provide somebody a little comfort or a create, maybe inspire someone else's creative outlet. But the fact that we can pay it forward by helping to fund a number of different organizations with a focus on youth, by the way, with a real focus on emerging artists, whether they are visual or cinematography or, or photography, um, you know, the Albany Center Arts Gallery, the Opalka Gallery that, that hosted this amazing event. Uh, we're going to do scholarships in his name. And later in the show, we'll continue our conversation with Assemblymember Pat Fahey, an Albany Democrat. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals in education, human services, and health care. For listeners just joining us, we're continuing our conversation with Assemblymember Pat Fahey, who's speaking with us about her son, Brendan Fahey Beckett, who died earlier this year at the age of 25 and has had some of his photographs used for a new book that preserves his money and raises money for arts initiatives in the capital region. The book can be purchased at bfbfund.com. You mentioned the idea of art as a way to help soothe the the soul. So while you were dealing with this as a, a parent, both while Brendan was alive and then through the grieving process, was there any f- sort of art that you gravitated toward? Anything that you found comfort in? Uh, I tried everything. <laughs> as, as I told people, if uh, you told me to sit in a box for 10 hours a day, I would have done it. Um, but yes, I, I gravitated a lot toward uh, more the written word. I found myself reading a lot about grief, uh, reading a lot about what others have been through. And I found myself journaling a lot. And maybe at some point I will share some of that. It's, um, but that, that helped me. I will say every time we saw him, even when for five minutes, if we saw him pull out the camera, it just lifted my heart because I knew he wasn't thinking cancer. He, wasn't, he was fighting the nausea. It always gave me hope that he was finding an outlet. So it's just given me a, such a profound appreciation for the arts, which I really began to learn even after 9-11, that the arts can take tragedy and find some beauty in it. Um, so I've, uh, while I'm not artistic at all, I, I've had just this profound respect for those who can take tragedy and convert it or help us to translate it or help to find some beauty. And so I knew when Brendan was doing this, it, it would be helpful. He also did love music. Uh, and I'm not going to remember the names, but we have his playlist. And um, we play it all the time now when we're in the car because we were often back and forth between Albany and New York City. Uh, he had an unusual taste of uh, a, a, a well, unusual. I think Gen Z might not Gen necessarily Z, sorry, line yes. up with Gen someone, Z, someone our yes, age. Yes, yes, but I we love it now. We just love it, and yes, that's right. I'm <laughs> I'm dating myself. Yeah. Uh, but he he definitely at one point he was learning relearning the piano in college. Uh, he was my rena- my little Renaissance man. Given the time commitment that was involved in 
trying to help him access treatment. A and then in the aftermath uh, of his death, the grieving process that you went through, what does that make you think about the state's paid family leave policy, if I can do a hard left turn? Because, for example, the policy does not include bereavement, which was something that was under consideration but had been vetoed by the former governor. Do you think that we need to expand this program in some meaningful way, or do people just need to figure out how to make things work. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I'm a big supporter of the, the paid family leave because I know it is so important uh, as so many, um, especially of my generation, are, are in the, what they call the sandwich generation, right? Young kids, yet uh, parents to, to take char care of. Um, so the point is, I'm, I am grateful I had some flexibility to be there. And, and as it turns out, because of COVID, I was able to work remotely while in New York City. But yes, it did put tremendous strain. Uh, I did so many press interviews, uh, even in the hospital lobby. Uh, one time there was a conference I didn't want to miss. And I, he, at that point, he was inpatient. And I did the conference from his bedside. In some ways, work uh, helped keep me moving. But in many ways, it does add to uh, a lot of the stress of trying to juggle all. Uh, it made me more efficient, and I just made the time. Uh, I have a very typical mother's guilt, <laughs> which I work on every day. Um, even long before he got ill, it's it's very hard to juggle. Uh, this job, as you know, can be seven days a week. You're never not working in many ways, um, uh, or you're always on call, if you will. Uh, so I've, I've had to learn to juggle long before he got ill. And I, I found myself, if I could help others, you know, some ways it was helping him. So I was very involved in helping so many families, uh, whether it was getting access to nursing homes or uh, to see families or whether it was working on behalf of uh, the, the school districts for uh, COVID money or visitation policies. Uh, the whole Afghan issue a year ago, I became obsessed with trying to save some of the uh, family members of local uh, constituents uh, and some of it was if I felt like the more I can help others, the more I'm, you know, helping again to pay it forward for my son. Well, yeah, so your son died in the weeks leading up to the adoption of the state budget, which <laughs> is probably the most important time uh, on the legislative calendar. And you were in Albany for the uh, adoption uh, of that budget, missing just a, a couple weeks uh, in, in early March. Um were there any lawmakers or, or staff that were uh, particularly helpful in that time period? Or did people not really know what to say to you at that time as you're going through this unique experience? W what was it like uh, navigating w with all these different people? Well, sometimes I feel like I'm in a fog. I'm still in a fog of grief in many ways. But I felt it was important. Uh, the 787, we wouldn't have gotten that money had I not been there to speak up for it. And that's um, money to study a revamp of to, the highway to uh, reimagine outside of Albany. Yeah, to reimagine. Uh, the, the, I felt we needed to tighten up on some of the criminal justice issues uh, with regard to guns. I think you know I've been a huge gun safety advocate and gun control advocate. I, I knew I needed to come back on a, on a host of issues and um, to, to continue to be a voice. So it was hard, uh, and I will say there's no one that helped me more than John McDonald, uh, who is my colleague here in Albany, and now re who knows what redistricting is going to bring with the with that roller coaster. Uh, but uh, but so many colleagues continued to reach out, and but you're but yes, of course, I think people see me working full time, and um, uh, there are still many people who really don't know what to say, and I get it. Every everybody grieves differently, and everybody. It's a very awkward thing. Um, so I'm still appreciative when people recognize it. Um, and, uh, and some people say, Pat, I don't know what to say. And I said, that's okay, that's enough. Especially young people, I think they don't know what to say. And sometimes when they say that, I say, that's okay. I appreciate you even acknowledging that uh, this is sad. And um, I've done a lot, a lot of reading and talking to others who have had similar tragedies, in some cases worse, If you not that you can compare losses, but so many people have lost people over COVID. So many people, you know, lost people to murder or it, it's just amazing. The, the, 
uh, it, it's a hell of a club is all I can say. And you learn more and more uh, families, particularly who have lost children. And the one thing that I've read that has helped me a lot is that you, you never get over it. You don't get over it. You just learn to keep moving forward. And so every morning I tell myself, okay, I'm going to move forward. I try to find time every day to just remember him. I have his photos everywhere I turn in my house. Well, you talked a lot about uh, doing a lot of reading and the art of processing. And I think you described yourself as a bit of a, a recluse in, in some of these I endeavors. And you know, you don't obviously have to answer this, but in the process of all this grieving, have you sought out help? Have you turned to, to mental health support or uh, groups uh, of people where you can share these stories? Um, and anything like that? I, I appreciate that question, and I'm one who is always advertising others and fighting to get mental health uh, money and, and focused on wellness. While I've tried a couple of times uh, over the years, um, and I've tried again, I'm, I'm not the best with that myself, uh, partly because I have three older sisters, and I would take turns on each one of them during this process. And one of them, if I called her at 3 a.m., she's going to answer the call. Um, she just guided me through all of this. So I have I have some wonderful support systems that have really helped me, and that has helped. And I have an entire extended family. My mother still has two sisters, uh, one still in Ireland, one in England, and they called repeatedly. So I have this huge family that I relied on is so many local electeds just so I, I have a support system. I read, I exercise, I meditate a tiny, tiny, not never enough, but, um, you don't strike me as someone who would be successful at meditating. Yes, that's, I, that's right. <laughs> I, don't, I can't imagine you quieting your mind for very long. Guilty, guilty. Um, <laughs> that's right. So I say I try, um, but I do, I, I, I work on every, I journaled a lot during this and that helped because it was so incomprehensible um, and it was so all engrossing. And then at, at times having to switch gears to take a call, we were waiting on Brendan's oncologist, his main oncologist and Governor Cuomo called and, and I, I happened to be sitting right in the room next to Brendan. And Brendan was not political, neither of my children are, and, but I handed the phone over and it distracted him for one minute. And I'm always appreciative. I know there's been uh, a lot there. And then fast forward, I found out that at Brendan's funeral, Governor Hochul, Kathy Hochul, flew in just to come to the, to the wake, the night of the wake. So those things, again, that's why I'm so focused on paying it forward, but those things provide comfort and the support of the community at least 300 people showed up to uh, buy his book. In fact, some of them couldn't even get through the line to buy his book. That's my therapy. But but again, I, I don't want to answer this in the wrong way because... I don't I, think there's a wrong way to answer it. Right, it's your own personal I, process. Well, but I, I, I always encourage people. Um, but helping my daughter, helping his girlfriend, helping others is also... Uh, part of my therapy. So I have, I have multiple ways that I try to handle this and others would tell you I need <laughs> I need help 24-7. So there you go. <laughs> I, I should be doing much more to help my, you know, help get through this. Well, maybe some of those people thought you needed the help before. That's right. Though. That's right. Many of those would <laughs> readily agree with that. Gotcha. Well, putting your state lawmaker hat back on, which I have to imagine is something that you're wearing constantly. And yes. in light of that, uh, as you went through this process, which regardless of what kind of insurance you have, could not have been cheap, did you begin to think at all about the cost of health care and the way we in New York pay for health care? Has it changed the way you, you think about uh, this issue in any way, shape, or form, or maybe strengthened uh, beliefs that you already had? Healthcare is a mess in this country, there's no doubt. I, I think it's more challenging in many countries, right? So maybe it's a mess around the world, right? And COVID really pointed that out. Yes, we need to fix healthcare. I don't see how we can fix it to the degree we need to, unless we address some of this at the national level, uh, just because it is so prohibitively expensive and uh, without support from the feds, it will be very difficult for us. 
And I don't know how we begin to solve some of this. Right now we have a workforce crisis. Uh, so yes, it's made me more motivated to recognize the need of how we need to make sure folks are fully insured. I know we're better than virtually every state, I think, because we're at 95%. Uh, but I ended up with full coverage. Uh, did we pay a lot um, while trying to live in New York City? Yes, we, we spent a lot of money out of pocket so that my husband and I could be there. He was never alone after the cancer came back. I was never alone for a day. So yes, I'm, I'm grateful that I have a job that provides me uh, uh, a subsidized insurance. And it, it made the difference that Brendan was able to get uh, good care well, we've been speaking with Assemblymember Pat Fahey, an Albany Democrat, and a book of photographs captured by her late son, Brendan Fahey Beckett, can be purchased at bfbfund.com. Thank you so much for making the time, Assemblymember. It's an honor. Thank you so much for your interest in my life, my son's life, and thank you for having me. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. UnionStrongNY.com for more information.